Awesome. Okay, Joey, I'm going to screen share and mute the live stream on my end, and then we should be good to go. Awesome. All right. Welcome, everybody. I am Joey Zocker. I'm the executive director of Trans Center for Youth and one of the um, advisors of Escuela Verde which is a independent public charter school located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And Escuela Verde, we um, are a school that's a small high school. We have 120 students and part of our curriculum is grounded in project-based learning and also in um, social justice and environmental justice. And so we really like to help our students think about their learning around how can they collaborate with the community and um, share what they're learning with the community. So not just learn from the community, but also um, as they're learning and growing, share what they've learned back with the community. And so as a part of that, our curriculum offers uh, multiple, really one, one community night a month. And of these community nights, they include things like community potlucks and Day of the Dead celebrations. And in February, um, Science Strikes Back is our community event. So this event, um, we love it every year. Typically we spend the year um, put throwing a big party. We like to think of science fair as like a big party because there's all these amazing people of all ages who gather, who share their passion and share their excitement and uh, we learn from each other. So um, this year we had to go virtual. You'll get to see a little bit of that, but um, either way, the community was just as strong and we're really excited um, to be able to keep moving forward with this. And with that, that's really all I have for an introduction because what I'm most excited about is introducing our, our partners in this. We've collaborated a lot. We couldn't do any of our community events without the community. And for this particular partnership, it's with Upham Woods, who has initially kind of started out with some of the pre-planning many, many years ago, and then has helped kind of take the lead on helping us organize it and keep this event thriving and growing it every year. So with that, I think I'm going to pass it off over either back to you, Isabel, or over to Justin. Over to Justin. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Well, hello. My name is Justin Huffam. I am the director at Upham Woods Outdoor Learning Center, which is um, in the Dells, but I'm also a state specialist for environmental education. And we, um, Science Strikes Back is probably one of my favorite events that we get to be a part of all year. And um, for, for lots and lots and lots and lots of reasons, like you'll hear from Ronan and Isabel later. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about it and it just came out of another meeting and it occurred to me, it's like, where did, where did this start? Where do we begin? And it began with um, some of our work with our DOTS kits. And it's this yellow box. And this yellow box that I have at, at the ready has a sticker on it to always remind me of this, Science Strikes Back. Um, and what, what's in this box isn't so important. It's, it's what we try to get the box to do, which is to help folks collect data and information about their world and how to tell stories about what they found and what they think it means. And um, that's, I think, where Joey and our relationship began, is in that philosophy. And really, when you come towards a science fair with those things in mind, how do we collect more information about the world? And how do we tell stories about what we find and learn? Um, we get a kind of a different philosophy, a different vibe, different, um, you know, intrinsic motivation around science. And that's, that's really what keeps us coming to the table and excited to... Um, to collaborate. So um, I think that's about all I have to say about that. And, and next up is Isabel. Sure. So hi, folks. I'll just make a quick housekeeping note here. I am monitoring the YouTube uh, chat, chat box, and I will do a period of questions once Ronan is done presenting. And then towards the end of this whole Shindig, we'll do another round of questions. There is about a 20 second delay, um, just so that you're aware of that. Um, but yeah, I'll be monitoring. Feel free to fill up the chat. It looks like people are already sharing their thoughts. It's wonderful. Um, and I don't know if we mentioned anything else here, but Ronan was one of our category winners of the 
math category because he handled his data excellently. Yeah, that's right, pump it up, Ronan. Um, so I just jumped over to that page where you can see some of our other winners from this past category. And Ronan, I'm now gonna jump over and it's your time to shine, make a new screen share. So you could go ahead and unmute whenever you're ready and I'm gonna get this going. Okay. I think I'm ready. So my experiment was a naked egg experiment and it was about this experiment. So I looked it up online. Apparently you can make an egg that does not have a shell yet it's still very strong. So next page. So the supplies needed for the experiment was one glass or jar filled with white distilled vinegar. I did two types, you know, to see, you know, if there'd be a difference, you know, it's drifting off course of the main experiment. It, it, well, if you want to do it like mine, you'll need one glass or jar filled with white distilled vinegar, one glass or jar filled of the same size with apple cider vinegar, two raw refrigerated eggs, a notebook for observations, and also a timer or a clock. So next page. So what I did is, so the first thing is to put a raw egg into like each glass, make sure not to break the shell. And then, well, the, you only like two glasses, you put both of them in one and then fill one glass with apple cider vinegar and the other one with the white distilled vinegar and monitor the eggs over 24 hours. And then I, and also you'll have to write down observations, visualize the eggs changes and fill the eggs to observe the changes after 24 hours, remove each egg and record the findings. And it came up with some interesting results. So my hypothesis was the, my first hypothesis was the white vinegar would dissolve the shelled egg, but the apple cider vinegar would partially dissolve the eggshell at a slower rate. I forgot why I hypothesized that, but it was my first hypothesis. Next page. <laughs> So here is all the things that happened. So this is me like putting them in and over like, over like an, like um, a while, they, it was like becoming really interesting. So these are all the pictures of me doing the experiment. So yeah, next page. So, um, so I, so I observed them over um, each hour. So it was cup A, which was the apple cider vinegar, and I nicknamed it Churchill, just came to mind. And and then I began the experiment at 11 p.m. with that one, the other one, which was cup B, which was white distilled vinegar, aka Bobby. So it be, so I continued to monitor it. And then at 11 15 a.m., I mean p.m., I saw the size of the bubbles in the in cup A, like basically the there'd be bubbles forming on top of the egg shell, and the bubbles were increasing, like increasing in size, and the egg was bobbing and rising to the top, and I found that interesting. Then I eleven that at the same time with the cup B, it was staying close, like to the top. The egg was bobbing and rising, but it was staying more close to the top, so it was pretty still. Then at 12 a.m., I, I um, look at it again, and then print, and I saw that the eggshell start, like on cup A, the eggshell started to expand, and then the shell, wait, the shell changing, and like stop, and it stopped bobbing too, which I found interesting. And it just stood still at the top. My hypothesis for that was at the time that there was so much gas on like bubbles that it actually outweighed the actual mass of the egg. So it floated up to the top with all that gas on it. And at the same time with cup B, the egg continued to bob up and down. And then sometimes it momentarily stop at the top and it would continue. And then at 1.15 p.m., I saw on cup A, the eggshell was starting to get softer and some of it was actually dissolving and floating up to the top. So the eggshell was being removed. At the same time, um, it was also, it was the same thing on both of them. 
So they have both had the same um, thing happening to them at 11 at 1.15 p.m. Then at 8.15 p.m., I observed in cup A, the egg lost its shell, but there is still a really weird hard spot. And then at 10.30 p.m., sadly, cup A. So I was, I was like, you know, experimenting with it, you know, seeing like how much it could withstand, seeing like how strong it was. And it broke and then it just splattered everywhere. My hypothesis was that since the apple cider, apple cider is like basically made out of apples, which apple cider also adds in the already acidic context of the apple with even more acid, plus making that with vinegar, that means that it was like too acidic and it simply just worn down the shell too much. Then at the same time, um, at that same time at 8.15, they lost its shell, but it but there's no hard spot. And then 10.30 p.m., most of the shell was gone. And also the membrane is very durable and strong, which later broke. So yeah, next page. So these are videos of my findings. And it was interesting because like, like you could see that you could see the like yolk, that's how much the shell degraded. And I was always afraid that I was just gonna suddenly break, but that was definitely my most favorite science experiment I ever did. Do you want me to play the other video too? Yeah. Do you want me to finish this one? Uh, nah. Okay, we'll jump right to the second one. Yeah. Well, oh, that one was really short. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> next page then, I guess. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this, this was the results of cup um, B, the white distilled drinker, AKA Churchill, very strong and like I could see all the way through and it was just really weird seeing all the way through without a shell and the results of cup A aka Bobby and it like it, like the shell was still on there and it was I kind of had to scrub some of it away and it kind of just broke that was my observations next page Yeah, that was my science experiment. <laughs> awesome. Well, we got some questions and comments from the chat. If you'd, uh, if you're willing to entertain them, here we go. Okay. So a lot of excitement. People are really proud of you. Um, UW Madison Science Expeditions. We are so excited to learn about some of these projects and can't wait to hear from Ronan. Um, so proud of my grandson. And then some comments, there was a lot of curiosity around why or how one of the eggs floated and the other one sank. So here we go. We've got, how did you, all right, relatedly kind of, uh, how did you decide on what data to collect, including the sinking and floating of the eggs? Um, uh, if I'm being this right, I think if I'm like being like the, like the meaning correctly, I think I like, I decided that, you know, like if there was like those little small change, you know, say for example, like just something insignificant, I won't document that. And also that's kind of what the meaning, I think I don't really know the meaning of that, but yeah, maybe more detailed meaning. <laughs> What do you mean the meaning behind why it sank and another one bought? Oh, okay, now I get it. So okay. I think why it sank is because like, so why one sank is because maybe, is because I think that one just generally had, you know, 
less gas and carbon dioxide and bubbles built up on that one, so it just sank because it was heavier. But then the other one, the um, cup A, was extremely acidic, and it and like it created so much bubbles from all of the like from the like carbon dioxide and stuff being released from dissolving the eggshell. So there's so much, there's so much eggshell being dissolved at such a great rate that it actually outweighed the weight of the eggs itself. So it bobbed up. And then sometimes like it would bob down a bit because some of the carbon, some of the bubbles would be released a bit, but then eventually after it gets released, there'd be another, you know, small layer of shell saying it out while it's going back down, there'd be some more bubbles that came back on. So then once it touched the surface again, all the bubbles would be released because like bubbles can't survive anywhere but like water unless they're certain type. So then it just kind of goes down. Then it starts building up again. So yeah, that's what I observed. Hmm. And how did you, what data, or how did you decide on what data to collect? Um, I decided on what data to collect, like, what's the meaning of that? <laughs> I don't really know. Oh, mm -hmm. uh -huh. I get what you were saying. So how did you decide to focus on the fact that the eggs were bobbing versus sinking and how did you decide to focus on uh, the consistency of the membrane? Like why did you, how did you decide on those things or why did you pick those things to measure? I just, I decided that because like, because like instead of ignoring it, like even if it was the smallest of change, like so, like I'd always set a timer. So once I came back to it, I'd always, no matter if there was if there was no visible changes, I would always like pick it up, fill it, but very gently, and then that's how I collected it. I it wouldn't matter if there's a big change, very unnoticeable small change, I I'd, I'd still observe it and still write down the same. So I write down the information I observed even if nothing happened. That's some good science. That makes sense to me. <laughs> and then <laughs> some other people were noticing or commenting in the chat about the times that you were collecting your data and that you were a studious scientist. When did you sleep? You were collecting data um, at all sorts of different times. Oh, yeah. the I just times. have a horrible sleep schedule after school got canceled. My sleep schedule got messed up, so now I'm kind of used to staying awake at night. It's not healthy, but I'm kind of used to it now. So, yeah, and plus, I don't really need much energy, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah, I was dedicated. <laughs> as long as you're getting, you know, enough enough sleep, you know, good eat after you go to bed. <laughs> well... If there are any more questions that pop up in the chat, we will now address those towards the end of our presentation here. We're gonna switch gears and talk about the Wisconsin River Quest study. Uh, unfortunately, our presenter messaged me just a couple minutes after this started saying that she would not be able to make it. Fortunately, I helped her work on the project. So I will um, tackle it from here on her behalf with Linda in the Nasita after school uh, program. And they did this Wisconsin River Quest study. So this project, the Wisconsin River Quest that the study was then based off of is a ArcGIS story map. So there's little dots on a map. And when you click them, you can read a story that the students of this after school program contributed to any and all stories um, about their experiences on the Wisconsin River. And they're out in this area, so right by Buckhorn State Park in the Wisconsin River. It's a really important part of their community. And after we completed that project, some of the students continued to be curious about, you know, what did people talk about in their stories? So our question was, what issues or things do students in the Nasita after school program care about in the Wisconsin River? And as we began to do that, it led to some additional research questions like, what do people enjoy doing on the Wisconsin River? And what kinds of fish will I catch around Nasita? We received a lot of fishing stories. So 
we looked at all of the stories that we had collected and then as a little after school program project coded them or connected all right this person's talking about kayaking so we're going to describe that as one of our paddling stories someone talked about uh hooking an invasive species, a carp, instead of, you know, a bluegill like they were hoping. Uh, and that was categorized as a fishing story. So if you have questions about that, you can throw them in the YouTube uh, chat and we can keep digging into that. But um, that's how we kind of coded into swimming, paddling, and fishing stories. And some of our top, top, our top themes uh, were invasive species and talking particularly about carp and the way that they're affecting the river. Uh, recreation was a big one, paddling and boating on the Wisconsin River as well as swimming. Fishing was, was very popular. Most of our stories, 46% of our stories ended up being about fishing. Uh, and, you know, noticing the different animal habitats. There was some there was a story about a beaver dam, I believe, and then concerns about green algae, blue-green algae, and how it would affect people's recreating. There was a girl who shared a story about how uh, her dad had to carry her mom out of the boat to the shoreline because she's so allergic, she breaks out in a huge rash from blue-green algae on her skin. So it was really interesting seeing what stories surfaced um, from these from this after school program. And all of these kids were about middle school age, some were fourth or fifth grade. Wow. Yeah, so uh, for our answers, we determined that the most common kinds of fish that were reported in the stories were sheep's head, crappie, carp, bluegill was definitely a crowd favorite, as well as some catfish. And, you know, Collectively as a group, our little Wisconsin River Quest study, we thought that um, boating would be more popular than fishing as a theme, but you know, fishing won out by you know, an extra 20% compared to paddling. And then there were very many successful fishing trips in the area as well. So that was the study. And I'm just gonna switch gears and show you all the actual Wisconsin River Quest as well. And these are all linked on our Science Strikes Back Story Map program, which is connected to this event. Um, and so you can watch the recordings of the stories and look at these all later as well. So this is that story map feature. You can see the different points where all the students submitted their stories and teachers. And um, the Upham Woods team, we added these hyperlinks so people could access more information in case they were curious. But here we go. Here's Steven's story, Fish for Fun and Food by Steven. My family fishes sometimes on the Wisconsin River. We go there to fish, to catch fish, and to eat. We go to fish for fun and to teach me how to fish. I go fishing with my mom and dad. We fish for sport and we fish for food. We go fishing in April for spring fishing and go in December for ice fishing. And then there's a little picture and then in their after school program, this is where they physically wrote, wrote out. And like I said, there's about ooh, 16 or so stories of those. And I'm gonna pop over here and look and see what questions we have in the chat. And ah, thank you UW-Madison Science Expeditions for dropping the, link to the Wisconsin River Quest chat. Hmm, doesn't seem like we had any questions about the Wisconsin River Quest study quite yet, but there is a delay. And Ronan, if you're willing to field another question, um, would you? Ronan? Um, how do you think of a good question? Uh, hmm. I put you on the spot. Okay, I, I can't think of any good questions. That's a cool project, though. Yeah, kids yeah. just wrote stories and then <laughs> reflected on it to see what they learned and see what else they could learn about their community. I think it was cool, too. Yeah, that would have been fun. But yeah, it's, I don't have any good questions. That's fine. Someone's got a question for you, though, in the chat. Wednesday night at the lab, they say, Ronan, would you be willing to retry your experiment at this time 
with three eggs in the white vinegar and the eggs in apple cider vinegar. So you could test if the two vinegars give different actions. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah I will. <laughs> I'll try to whenever I have the time to. So yeah, yay, I can do that again. <laughs> And we had a, a question come in. We did not, so the Wisconsin River Quest was put together in the fall. So most of those stories were kind of centered around their summer and fall experiences on the river. The only reference we have to winter activities were the ice fishing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, well, I, Joey, do you mind if I show that uh, video about science at Escuela Verde as a little bit more context around Science Strikes Back? Yeah, of course, go for it. Awesome. Let me just make sure that I... I'm not hearing any sound. I don't know if others are. Yeah, I'm not hearing any either. Thank you. Well, then this might not, hmm. Well, we'll add this one to the chat and maybe people can. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, they can watch it on their own time. Um, I will pull out my back pocket project to cover the last bit of time we have here that compares um, the ecosystems in Wisconsin to Shrek's swamp. So while I'm pulling that up though, um, can I pass it over to Justin or Joey to, to fill the void with a little bit more science strikes back know-how while I just pull that up? Sure, I can jump in to say just a little bit. One of the things that we've talked about when planning these activities and what the video shows is, so I'm a high school science teacher. That's what I've done for the last 20 years. And for me, I'm super passionate about decolonizing science education and really focusing on making science accessible to all, um, all students and all adults. And I think opportunities like Science Strikes Back allows for people of all ages to come together to share what they're doing and <clears throat> to get better at, at doing science, but also to uh, have fun and enjoy it. And I think looking at what's happening in our society right now, a lot of folks are intimidated by science or just don't believe in science. And um, so this is one of those opportunities where we think gathering as a community and sharing knowledge um, and having fun kind of starts to break down some of those barriers that a lot of, a lot of our students typically don't have the opportunity to do. So there's, in addition to that video, there's lots of good research that we've been pulling together on this and how, how we can take some action on the way that we teach science in order to make it something that all students love. I mean, Ronan is clearly a scientist and will be for life, but not everybody feels that way at such a young age. So how do we help um, incorporate science into all, all students and get everybody excited about science? And so this project you're going to introduce here, Isabel, is one of those things like it's, you know, a little bit fun, but there's actual really good science behind it as well. And so it's kind of that hook of how do we make it fun and relevant for all. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right. It is just now opening. Um, but the basis of this research 
or this ecosystem comparison was led by environmental conservation graduate students at the Nelson Institute using primarily um, Curtis, the vegetation of Wisconsin from 1959, and then obviously Shrek. <laughs> the data was all pulled from that first movie. Okay. Uh, it doesn't look like it went to presenter mode, did it? Excellent. All right. I was one of the presenters as was, uh, oh, it stopped screen sharing. I'm sorry. As was Justin and his daughter. Um, there you go at the bottom there. All ages, right? All ages community science fair. So our primary questions coming into this ecosystem comparison were, how does Shrek Swamp compare to Wisconsin wetlands? And could Shrek live in Wisconsin? And we did some background research, watching that opening sequence about a thousand times, conducted what is called a site inventory of Shrek Swamp, meaning we documented all of the flora and fauna, all of the plants and animals and then we compared those to the species lists provided by Curtis um, for various Wisconsin wetlands. So the site inventory analysis would include site history, which for this particular ecosystem we know is ruled within the kingdom of Duloc. We noted in landforms, topography, soils, all that, all of it. Um, so we watched a bunch. It's the Middle Ages in Shrek, and we're looking at Shrek kind of as an ogre species, uh, expanding his territory by putting up these signs around the forest. And <laughs> this is our first look at some of his habitat. You know, he's intelligent enough to be able to mod modify his surroundings, including some landscaping. We think that some of the packed ground there was done by Shrek rather than the dirt naturally being that compacted and he was close to some fresh water and some springs and the swamp would naturally provide some pollutant filtration. So when it comes to stressors that this ecosystem was facing, we know that the Lord Farquaad banished many of these fairy tale creatures, which was a massive population increase for this particular part of the swamp. That's really a concern, right? All of a sudden a massive influx of different animals and species. So he goes about trying, he engages in conservation to try and help uh, find these folks an, a better place for their home since they were uh, involuntarily moved to his swamp. And when we were looking at the flora and fauna or the flora represented, we noticed there was cattails, water lilies, um, green fungus that we couldn't really identify more specifically. And then this cottonwood tree hybrid which we determined to be pretty unique to Shrek Swamp. So here's a picture of the cattails and a comparison to them in real world outside of Shrek land, the water lilies, duckweed, the sedge grasses, long tall grasses, some of that moss. So the soils, right, I commented earlier that there was some dark or hard packed dirt. We also see some really dark coloration as well and lots of mud. So the dark in color maybe makes us think maybe it's got more iron in it or, or low oxygen, not entirely sure. And then for topography, we know that we think that Shrek's at a low point surrounding him because we've got those hills uh, in the background. And then when they first approach the swamp, they're doing so coming down from a hill as well. <laughs> the water systems, so there's this little creek that when Shrek and Donkey first meet, they walk along to get down to the swamp. We also know that there's standing water in the swamp area. And we are uncertain if this picture in the bottom left is a river or a lake. Um, and that would be pretty important to figuring out what kind of an ecosystem this is, but you know, can't get everything. As for some of the insects around there, these are some of the comparisons that we drew from Shrek land to real world, <laughs> video of the rope beetle with him brushing his teeth. <laughs> um, you know, there's a massive slug in Shrek land. And so there's just not a uh, planet earth comparison. The closest we got was the yellow slug and the Linux slug. Macroinvertebrates. Now we think that the bluebirds represented in Shrek are another unique species 
blend between these two, which I believe are the Eastern Bluebird on the left and on the right, you've got your Mountain Bluebird, Rocky Mountain Bluebird specifically. So comparing it to some of those Wisconsin wetlands, we focused predominantly on three just so that we would not keep going crazy with all of these comparisons and finding the perfect one. We're looking for just what, what translates. And so for the sedge meadow, you know, we've got those sedge grasses. There's quite a lot of them around and particularly on top of Shrek's home. Similarities include that they're both in wetlands or lowlands uh, with wet, dark soils. And there is a lot of gas in that ecosystem. Um, yeah. Some differences would be that we would expect more flowering plants from a sedge meadow and less trees. And then we've got the white pine red maple swamp, uh, which is kind of specific to the central sands plains or the Wisconsin Dells area where Upham Woods is. Uh, with the white pine red maple, you know, we're seeing more mid-story and I can't tell you what the pH of Shrek swamp is, unfortunately, so I can't report on that. And mm -hmm. you'd expect to see some skunk cabbage. Shrek swamp didn't have a lot of mid-story. A lot of it was um, those taller trees and, uh, yeah, if we know the, if that water body that I highlighted earlier, if we knew whether or not it was a spring or a pond or a river, that would help us determine whether or not white pine, red maple would be a real fair comparison. Also, we didn't really see any red maples in Shrek Swamp. The Wisconsin hardwood swamp, you know, some similarities there, of course, low-lying areas, the high water table, and this one would be the biggest difference if we were able to point to um, the water from Shrek Swamp coming from precipitation, then we'd be like, oh yeah, Wisconsin hardwood swamp, especially with those cottonwood hybrid trees. Um, but since we don't know that, we, we don't know that. Um, and this is just another picture of what that Wisconsin hardwood swamp looks like. And you can just picture Shrek there since this would be the closest one um, for, that he could live in in Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, we ended up deciding that it was maybe kind of a transitional ecosystem with the hardwood swamp as a, as a backdrop. And then this is a tamarack swamp up in the, the north woods of Wisconsin. Um, and then this is that sedge meadows again. And so we kind of think maybe it was a culmination of some of those different features, but we're still missing, yeah, cattails and water lilies in these, which you can sometimes find in tamarack swamps, which was why we threw them in there. But ultimately, doing our background research, you know, we found out that Shrek Swamp was actually based on a South Carolina magnolia plantation and that one of the artists was chased by an alligator. So they drew in this alligator chair here <laughs> just to commemorate that special moment that they had. And then, of course, when you start comparing the mosses, right, these are some very characteristic mosses of our southern swamps in the U.S., So I'm going to stop my screen share and almost out of time. So I'm going to check and see if we had any other questions come through on the live stream. Yeah, Ronan, what questions do you have? The question was just a note that has to be my favorite presentation I ever watched. <laughs> it's pretty goofy. Um, and if anyone wants to look at any of these recordings again, you know, that chat uh, box, I think we dropped the, the link to view all of the recorded presentations in there. And let's see, lots of positive feedback about the Shrek presentation. People like that it's goofy. <laughs> and Johanna commented about the goat presentation. We had a keynote presenter from the Ozaki Wildlife Land Trust. And she talked about her project using goats to manage or control invasive species. And once again, that's a recorded presentation available on the story map, or you can access it through um, www.sciencestrikesback.com and you can find your way there, but it should be accessible through the science expedition. I'll just pause and see if we have any other questions that come through. But yeah, Ronan, you did Science Strikes Back last year. You did it this year. Are you thinking about 2020? Oh, I guess it would be 2021 since it's in February. Are you going to come again? We'll keep winning. 
do it each year, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> what do you get out of Science Strikes Back that you keep coming back? It's just fun. I mean, it's science. Science is kind of my speciality. So it's just kind of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's what Science Strikes Back is all about, the fun, wacky side of science. I think if we've proven anything, it's that. <laughs> <laughs> Great, it seems like uh, things are kind of wrapping up in that chat there. Yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. Way to go, Ronan is right. That was yeah. an experiment. And they said, I did see uh, someone amended their, their comment earlier that you should do three eggs in each vinegar type. That was the what they were trying to say before, instead of three eggs in, in the distilled vinegar and one egg in the other. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm definitely gonna do that. I'm gonna do that whenever I have time. <laughs> yeah, you gotta sleep too. Yeah, I was gonna say like you mean at like eleven o'clock at night, Ronan? <laughs> no. <laughs> sometimes I just sometimes I stay up doing school for so long I go to sleep at like two a.m. Oh well. I have bad symptoms. I'm practically nocturnal now. <laughs> my uh, my older sister is a, a physicist. She came to Science Strikes Back as well, and she's very similar. When she feels, you know, when she strikes the urge to do some science, that's when she does her science. <laughs> it doesn't matter what time of day it is. <laughs> All right, should we uh, just kind of wave goodbye to everyone on YouTube? Bye. Have a good day. Have a beautiful evening. Do some science.